Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Diplomatic Dialogue. My name is Jacqueline La Guardia Martinez, and I'm going to be the chair for the session this afternoon. And before introducing our guest speaker, I would like to invite Dr. Montut, the director of the Institute of International Relations, to deliver the welcome remarks. Dr. Montut. Chair of this afternoon's proceedings, Your Excellency Alvaro Enrique Sanchez Cordero, Ambassador of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela to Trinidad and Tobago, Excellencies, invited guests, colleagues, and staff of the Institute of International Relations, students, distinguished audience, good afternoon. As we are still in the month of January, I take the opportunity to wish you and your family the very best for 2023. It is indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to welcome you to the Diplomatic Dialogue, the 210th anniversary of the Shaka Shikari expedition that liberated Eastern Venezuela in 1813. Today's event marks the first public event of the Institute of International Relations for the calendar year 2023. In keeping with the mandate of the Institute of International Relations, every year we host various kinds of events such as diplomatic dialogues, special guest lectures, seminars and workshops. These are intended to promote discussion and exchange of ideas with officials, practitioners, experts, students, and the general public on issues of relevance to international relations and regional affairs. Importantly, these public events gives the IR's work a regional reach, promote its public presence, generate knowledge, and advance its policy relevance. Many of these events are executed collab collaboratively with individuals and a wide range of organizations, including embassies, research and policy bodies, think tanks, national and regional governmental and non-governmental organizations. These partnerships highlight, among other things, the multidisciplinary nature of the IR's work and its ability to bridge the gap between theory, policy, and practice. The diplomatic dialogue in particular and special guest lectures engage ambassadors, government ministers, high-ranking officials, and IR professionals, visiting academics, among others, on international relations topics of relevance and interest to our students, stakeholders, and a wider audience. On this occasion, we are particularly pleased to collaborate with the Embassy of Venezuela in Trinidad and Tobago, and very honored to have Ambassador Sanchez present this very interesting lecture, which will illustrate the strategic role Trinidad and Tobago played in a very significant moment in the liberation and history of Venezuela. This will serve to contribute to historicizing the discussions around links between the two countries, as well as between Venezuela and the rest of the Caribbean region. I wish to thank Ambassador Sanchez profoundly um, for his time, interest, and goodwill, and look forward to building and expanding our partnership with the Embassy of Venezuela in Trinidad and Tobago. I also wish to offer congratulations to Dr. Jacqueline Laguardia Martinez for planning this event with the Venezuelan Embassy and thank the Secretariat, the UE Marketing um, and Communications Department, and others who assisted for their support. Deepest appreciation to our online audience and specially invited guests who have logged in to this event. Thank you very much for your presence and participation. I now hand you over back to the chair onto an interesting lecture and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Montut. I will now introduce briefly our guest speaker. We are very honored this afternoon to have his Excellency Alvaro Sanchez Cordero with us at the Institute of International Relations. Ambassador Alvaro Sanchez Cordero is the appointed Venezuelan ambassador to the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. In his previous diplomatic postings, Ambassador Sanchez Cordero has served in Barbados, the Netherlands, Russia, and the United Kingdom. Ambassador Sanchez Cordero has a history degree from the Inter-American University of Puerto Rico and has teaching experience at the Bolivarian University of Venezuela. The topic that the ambassador is going to uh, deliver and present uh, to us this afternoon 
is uh, is is talk is to talk about the 210th anniversary of the Chaca Chacare expedition that liberated Eastern Venezuela in 1813. Previously, the ambassador has uh, indicated to us that this is a very relevant topic to understand Venezuela and Trinidad and Tobago history links. But I'm talking no more because it is now the moment for the ambassador to deliver the presentation. Ambassador, welcome and please uh, you can start. And doctor, both doctors. I'm surrounded by female doctors, so that's very good. Dr. Anita Montut, director of the Institute of International Relations, IIR, of the University of the West Indies, UIS, and Augustin campus. Dr. Jacqueline Laguardia Martinez from the Institute of International Relations, IIR, of the University of the West Indies, UE. St. Augustine campus, students and staff from UE, St. Augustine campus, students and staff uh, online, specially invited guests. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here at uh, UE uh, this afternoon as uh, both uh, doctors uh, just uh, mentioned to briefly uh, speak to you about the 210th anniversary of the Chaka Chacare expedition. Uh, they also mentioned very correctly the relevance of this uh, historical achievement, uh, not only for Venezuela, obviously, but also for the enhancing relations between Venezuela and Trinidad and Tobago currently, because this is only one important further uh, statement in terms of how interlink, interwined, our histories, our culture, our societies uh, are uh, uh, all throughout. Uh, you can only, just by looking at uh, the proximity between both uh, uh, Venezuela and Trinidad and Tobago, you can only imagine how important these uh, rela relations and connection has been for centuries, eh, 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 even for millions of years, and, and I'll get that eh, in, in one second. But indeed, uh, uh, the Chaka Chaka expedition, which I'll try to explain eh, 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 somewhat in, in certain detail, especially because unfortunately not many people are, are aware of, of this important historical achievement, but it was uh, very important eh, for Venezuela particularly, because in 1813, uh, this expedition was the opening uh, to a new way to look at our independence. Uh, uh, Venezuela had been under the rule of the Spanish uh, monarchy for over 300 years prior to 1813. And uh, even though there were important attempts uh, of gaining independence, uh, even we gained our independence uh, in 1811, but nonetheless, we lost it immediately after, and I will touch upon that in a momentarily as well. But it was from Trinidad, from Chaka Chacari specifically, that uh, our hopes to be independent again uh, were were born, or where uh, it flourished. Really, if you think about it, uh, and and if you look at how uh, our heroes from independence took the ideas of independence all the way to practically the rest of South America. The, the same ideals of having a independence, autonomy, sovereignty, a, not only for Venezuela, but later on even Colombia, Ecuador, Peru was important, the creation of Bolivia. So if you look at it, half, at least half of South America was liberated, but practically much of it began in one small islet uh, of Trinidad. Chaka Chaka is the origin, the genesis of this um, important, outstanding historical achievement that encompassed practically, as I said, uh, half of, of South America. In other words, we can say that Chaka Chaka was a, a, a game changer uh, in, the, in the way that we perceive uh, our political process to gain independence in the early 19th century. So I have this uh, um, PowerPoint presentation. I'll, I'll go along with that. Uh, so you in the audience will uh, perhaps see in, in more graphic detail 
what I try to convey here, which as I said, is, is not only to uh, uh, um, recount the events that took place, a little bit of the context, a little bit of the prior history and so on, but most importantly, I think underlining the important strategic importance, political importance that Trinidad and currently Trinidad and Tobago at the time it was only Trinidad uh, has had for Venezuela all throughout. You see? Oh. Oh, okay, well, uh, we, well, I will be coming back to the maps because I have a, a, an interesting map behind me too that can also uh, aid uh, our presentation. It shows the proximity between Trinidad and, and Eastern Venezuela. Uh, uh, between seven and, and ten miles, depending on where you go to, but it's, it's very it's, it's very close. Especially Chacachacar is even closer to mainland Venezuela. Okay, but of course, uh, uh, one may think that Chacachacar was important only at that at this particular moment in history in 1813 when this expedition took place and so on, uh, which to an extent may be true, but in reality. Uh, Trinidad, generally speaking, has been fundamental in the formation of our nationhood. It has been instrumental in, in the way we conceive uh, our country because it's a very close uh, neighbor. And there are many aspects, political, cultural, etc., that link Venezuela and, and Trinidad. But to start off with, and, and I'm sure all of us here know this, but geologically, Trinidad was part of South America. So millions of years ago, uh, uh, we were one unit. Uh, Trinidad uh, was part of, of the South American subcontinent. So, so from there, you can only start thinking of all the uh, variables in terms of a union between Venezuela and, and Trinidad. But in more recent times, uh, uh, I mean, after these millions of years or, or right after, uh, consider as well that the indigenous people, that uh, the Amerindians who populated uh, Trinidad, were basically from Venezuela, from Eastern Venezuela, from the Guyanas, who uh, traveled all the way to, to Trinidad by, by boat, and also not only uh, Trinidad, but they also went into uh, the Eastern Caribbean, Barbados, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and so on. The same uh, 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 indigenous populations from Venezuela uh, moved along throughout the, the Caribbean. Later on, we'll see that the enslaved populations uh, who were brought here to the Americas by force, we also share the same uh, uh, ancestry, the same links in terms of our cultural ancestry as well. Equally important, Trinidad was part of, uh, for a brief period of time, Trinidad was part of Venezuela uh, for 20 years, between 1777, when the Spaniards uh, redesigned the, the map of uh, the, the geographical administration of their colonies. And ever since uh, Venezuela was entitled the general captaincy of Venezuela, at that time, in 1777, Trinidad was included as part of Venezuela. Of course, it ended in 1797, 20, 20 years after, because 1797, as you also know, was the year that the British uh, took Trinidad from, from Spain. And, and well, up until that point, Trinidad was part of, of Venezuela. And it, during that period, between 1797 and 1790, 1777 and 1797, specifically in 1789, the first ever printing press that Venezuela had was actually here in Trinidad. At that time, Trinidad was part of Venezuela. Uh, in, in fact, for many years uh, afterwards, when Trinidad was taken over by the British, uh, um, Trinidad had an advantage uh, or the British had an advantage over the Spaniards in Venezuela because they did have a printing press and the, the Spaniards in Venezuela uh, didn't, the, in Venezuela and mainland Venezuela. Uh, so that, that was uh, uh, quite relevant and historically speaking, whenever we refer to our first ever printing press, historically it was again, uh, it took place here in, in Trinidad. The, the first paper that came out from that printing press 
was called the courier of the Spanish Trinidad. Historically speaking, historically speaking, is is part of uh, our historical annals. And last but not least, and may, I'm sure there are many, many other angles and aspects that uh, historically link Venezuela and Trinidad, was the figure of Francisco de Miranda. For those of you who are not aware, I will briefly tell you about him because he was uh, he used Trinidad as uh, for many or many times as a, a base of his plans and schemes to liberate Venezuela from from Spain. But Francisco de Miranda was quite an interesting, important as well, but very, very interesting uh, historical figure, not only for Venezuela, but really for Latin America and the world. Uh, he was a, an individual who was always fighting and working towards the liberation of Venezuela and Latin America from Spain, but in his endeavors to secure Venezuela's liberation from Spain, he actually traveled to Europe. He traveled extensively around the world. At the time, it was not common to travel, even if you had money. You, it is only nowadays that um, traveling has become much easier and accessible. At the time, we're talking about uh, late 18th century. Uh, it was practically unthinkable. But he, as part of his own education, he went through Europe. He well, he joined uh, the Spanish army at the beginning, and therefore he was sent to Morocco in North Africa. So where he also was acquainted with uh, North Africa as part of the Spanish, uh, being a Spanish officer, he was also sent uh, to Jamaica, to Cuba. Uh, he participated in the wars of uh, independence in the United States. He was very well acquainted with George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and so on. And in Europe, he was also part of the French Revolution, fighting in the French Revolution. For us Venezuelans, it's, it's very uh, uh, enigmatic that uh, in the in the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, uh, the name of Francisco de Miranda is among the many uh, French Revolution heroes. He even went ahead and participated as as a military office officer in the Russian army of Catherine the Great. So this is a really enigmatic. Uh, fantastic uh, uh, individual that is really worth it. for those students who are listening. I I advise you to go and research on Francisco. There are even movies about him, which is also worth watching them. Some of them Venezuelan movies. But he, the the figure of Francisco Miranda is really really amazing, really interesting. Uh, how he at that again, considering the, the the moment that we're talking about, the end of the uh, 18th century, how he dominated the geopolitics of the day, how they traveled quite easily, uh, uh, spoke to world leaders of the time, always trying to secure uh, uh, the liberation of, of Venezuela, trying to secure support, financial, political, and otherwise, to obtain uh, the assistance needed to, to gain Venezuelan independence. But anyway, one of the major uh, he, he attempted a, a few times to liberate Venezuela, but one moment that he was close to liberating Venezuela was in 1806. He failed, and basically after that failure, he came to Trinidad uh, to find refuge. At the time, uh, the British government was uh, uh, aiding Venezuela, or to an extent, not, not so openly and not so... Uh, not not, not uh, very, very as perhaps Miranda would have wanted, but nevertheless, uh, he was able to come to Trinidad and spend time here uh, once his uh, I, I attempt to liberate Venezuela failed. So the, Francisco de Miranda himself, being such a figure, uh, such an important figure in Latin American, Venezuelan, and even world history, uh, the fact that, that he spent time here uh, is quite relevant and is also a further a link between Venezuela and, and Trinidad. And, and I will come back to Francisco de Miranda momentarily because uh, he also had to do with the issue that we have at hand, which is the Chaka Chakare expedition. Now, uh, in spite of the fact that there were indeed, uh, or there are indeed many links, uh, historical, cultural, political, that uh, bring together Venezuela and Trinidad. 
what is a, 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 I would say a bit um, a bit not perhaps expected is that particularly in 1812 there was a major influx of Venezuelans coming to Trinidad. So I said th th this has always happened throughout history. By the way, sometimes when people say, "Well, there are many Venezuelans in Trinidad," that has been going on for centuries. It's not just new. There are many, and there the reasons vary. Uh, 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 whether it's currently or or in in other times, but in 1812 there was a, a, a an increase in the number of Venezuelans who were coming to to Trinidad. Now let's explore a little bit why there were many Venezuelans coming to Trinidad in 1812, which will help us uh, determine or or understand or better understand the Chacachacari expedition. Uh, in in I will briefly uh, explain it uh, as this. Venezuela gained its independence in, on the 5th of July of 1811. Uh, it's, it, Miranda was particularly relevant in the gaining of, of our, our independence in, in 1811. So in theory, uh, Venezuela became independent from Spain in 1811. And up, up until that point, I would say that things were Okay, but the thing is that, uh, unlike in many other countries, uh, where independence really was the result of agreements, uh, of of mutual conversations, and so on, the case of Venezuela is quite different. It wasn't that easy. As a matter of fact, I would like to briefly share something uh, here. You know that when when I was uh, growing up, uh, I because Venezuelan. Uh, struggle for independence was really fierce, was bloody. We really, really uh, uh, spent a lot of uh, human lives in the whole process of uh, gaining our independence, which roughly began in 1811, perhaps a bit earlier, but it lasted until at least 1821. It was over uh, uh, 20, I'm sorry, 10 years of, of fierce, cruel fighting that, that, that took place. When I was growing up, I thought that all people, all countries in the world's independence had been obtained the same way as Venezuela. And then later on in life, I realized that it wasn't the case, that uh, many countries obtained their independence through negotiations or even if there was some kind of uh, movement and so on, it, it wasn't necessarily too costly in terms of human, human lives. But in this case, I think Venezuela is rather an exception because it was really costly in terms of how uh, we lost a, a, a great deal of, 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 of people in the whole in the whole process. And this is because Spain didn't want to let Venezuela go that easily. Uh, uh, when we gained our independence in 1811, immediately after, the following year, 1812, the Spaniards came back really strong on Venezuela. And, and uh, uh, well, there was a, Practically a whole year of of, uh, of battles of fighting between the patriots and the Spaniards. All uh, practically all throughout Venezuela, the Spaniards were led by a very vicious individual military officer called uh, Domingo de Monteverde, and the patriot forces were led by Francisco de Miranda and a young Simon Bolivar. You are going to start listening about Simon Bolivar a lot at this moment, but at this particular stage, Simon Bolivar was very young. There occurred a, a, a really important, controversial uh, moment in, in our history that even up until today, historians, politicians, etc., debate over what exactly happened, which is the following. An individual as prominent, as I explained, as Francisco de Miranda, who had really lots of military and political experience, who had traveled around the world, who had participated in the French Revolution, in the American Revolution, in Russia, had a really an outstanding individual. When it came to fighting against Monteverde, still people don't understand why he basically uh, agreed with him a surrender. And Venezuelans thought that it was he should not have done that because Venezuelan patriots had the uh, the, the the power to contain Monteverde to continue fighting at least, uh, but. He he said, well, in, in the papers, in the letters where Francisco de Miranda wrote to Domingo Monteverde saying, look, let's find an armistice where we find 
uh, a solution. We basically give up. Uh, he put put up some conditions, make, make sure that Domingo Monteverde, Spain, respect the lives of the patriots who will remain in Venezuela, uh, remain respect their properties, and so on and, and so forth. Um, and, and of course, he asked for himself a passport to be able to leave the country. What happened in that really confusing moment in 1812 was that uh, Simón Bolívar ended up uh, uh, taking Francisco de Miranda to the Spanish authorities, the Spanish authorities who had been looking after Francisco de Miranda were persecuting him and prosecuting him for many, many years. They finally captured him because Simon Bolivar handed Francisco de Miranda to them, and then he was put in jail where he died in 1816. But as I said, it's interesting that uh, uh, with apparently uh, capabilities to continue fighting against the Spaniards, uh, he agreed, quote unquote, a surrender to Spain through uh, Domingo Monteverde. Spain betrayed that uh, agreement with Francisco de Miranda, not only because they put Francisco de Miranda in jail, but most importantly, I would say, is the level of savage uh, counterattack and, and revenge from the Spanish authorities, from the Spanish government, towards the Venezuelan population who supported the independence of Venezuela. I am talking about cruel, cruelty perhaps will be an understatement. Uh, uh, people were taken from their houses, they were killed on the streets, they, they were mistreated, they were tortured, even children, even older people. Late years later, the, the 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 cruelty was so uh, astonishing on the side of the Spaniards against Venezuelan patriots that this is mainly the reason why uh, some years later Simon Bolivar uh, decreed the, the, the a, a, a total war against Spain without mercy as well. But it was really in response to what the Spaniards were really doing, which was um, uh, it was really really really, really devastating uh, for, for the Venezuelan population. So many Venezuelans, uh, considering that they were facing an imminent death, really, at the hands of the Spaniards, of Domingo Monteverde and so on, many had to flee to the closest place they could ever flee. Uh, some people fled, for example, to Curaçao, Aruba, Bonaire, which were in control, uh, the Dutch uh, authorities were, and they still are, by the way, in control of, of those uh, three islands. Others uh, went to, like for example, Simon Bolivar, he went originally or initially he went to Curaçao, but then he went to Cartagena, which is in, currently in Colombia. But Cartagena at the time was a liberated section of Colombia, independent. So Simon Bolivar felt free to move to Cartagena. But there were many, many others who actually came to Trinidad. A, again, trying to escape from the viciousness and cruelty and madness of Domingo Monte Monteverde. A, a, one of the persons who came to Trinidad was who was going to become the leader of the Chacachacar expedition and later on called the liberator of Eastern Venezuela, a Santiago Mariño. I will move here to the next. And as I said, Bolivar, was basically in Colombia, in Cartagena. And Santiago Mariño was, came here to, to Trinidad. Of course, for, for Mariño was relatively easy to come to Trinidad because he had Trinidarian links. Uh, his father was uh, a, a Venezuelan, but of uh, Spanish origin, but his mother was Irish who came actually to Trinidad. I'm not quite sure. This is one of the things that I need to uh, further research how uh, Santiago Mariño's parents met, uh, uh, but I I tend to believe that perhaps he was here in Trinidad in an, having an Irish mother, thinking of the the geopolitics of the moment. Many people from Europe, particularly France, with the cédula of population, but people from other European countries were coming to to Trinidad in the late 18th century if not for other reason, because Trinidad was depopulated. And the Spanish authorities uh, thought that an ingenious idea to have uh, 
uh, Trinidad more populated and being able to defend against the British was to bring French people, European people, mostly French, but then other other nationalities as well. So I think that perhaps this is why Marino's mother, who was Irish, came to Trinidad, and Marino's father had many properties in Trinidad, and particularly in Chaca Chacare, where practically the whole islet uh, was a, a, a state uh, of his uh, ownership, where he basically grew uh, cotton, maize, and, and other, other uh, fruits, and so on. Uh, uh, so the, the Marino had this connection with uh, Trinidad. He had been, he had studied in Trinidad as a youngster uh, in an Irish school in Port of Spain. So he was very well defined in terms of his Venezuelan linkages and so on. But he also uh, knew the dynamics uh, of of uh, Trinidad as a youngster. He joined the 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 militia of Trinidad. That again was also put in place by uh, uh, the Spaniards uh, uh, in in order to find some ways to counter an imminent attack that would become and, and that indeed came from from Britain uh, in the later 18th century. But anyway, the bottom line is that Bolivar is in Colombia, and Mariño came to Trinidad. Many other Venezuelans. I'm talking about the leaders, but many other Venezuelans also went to Cartagena to Curacao, and many. Many, many, lots of them came to to Trinidad. Interestingly, is that both Simon Bolivar and Santiago Mariño thought of regaining Venezuelan independence, uh, but they never were in communication. Of course, you know, uh, uh, not only we're talking about the era of uh, when there was no possibilities of communicating instantly uh, as we do now. But even if they were to write letters and so on, of course, they were intercepted. So they, they, there was really little possibility for them to communicate. But it's interesting that both of them thought of the same strategy, which was regaining Venezuelan independence in the case of, in the case of Simón Bolívar coming from Colombia, in the case of Santiago Mariño coming from, from Trinidad. And indeed, that's what happened the following year. But as I said, without them having agreed or Imagine if they had agreed, I think things would have been much smoother, but it was uh, quite interesting that uh, they both thought of the same. And, and, and what is also amazing is, uh, and, uh, well, more than amazing, the world would be brave on their behalf, is that in spite of all the cruelty in which the Spaniards were reacting towards the desires of Venezuelans to become independent, for many of the people, they would have thought, look, this is a lost cause because, of course, the Spaniards are really massacring us and, and th there is no point in, in continue fighting uh, the Spaniards and so on. So, therefore, uh, uh, they would have just given up. Well, they didn't give up. They, they carried on and, and planned uh, the retaking of uh, Venezuela and to regain its independence. And that's exactly what uh, Mariño, in the case of Mariño, Bolivar as well from Colombia, but in the case of uh, Mariño, he established himself in uh, Chaca Chacari for that purpose. The, it is just to briefly recount on this, the, the um, British uh, governors uh, in Trinidad and their position towards Venezuelan independence in, from 1797 to, 8, to 1803, Thomas Picton uh, was the governor of, of Trinidad. At that time, the uh, uh, Great Britain was actually not very openly, but was supporting somewhat Venezuelan uh, independence uh, uh, movement. And Thomas Picton particularly was a friend with Francisco de Miranda. He helped Miranda and so on. But one interesting thing about Picton is that in spite of his uh, aiding uh, uh, capabilities, of uh, two Venezuelan independence um, movements is that he had he was uh, famous or infamous depending how you look at it of having a tight control of Trinidad nothing will come in or out of Trinidad without him personally knowing so even for Venezuelans to plan an independent course of action for independence it was extremely difficult for them to deceive or to ignore the mandates of Thomas Picton. Uh, uh, so he he left this this network of spies of intelligence gathering even in Venezuela as well, 
uh, in terms of you know how he obtained information from Venezuela and so on. By the time that the Chacachacá expedition takes place in 1813, but really Mariño arrived in 1812, the governor governor was Hector William Munro, and he did not have the uh, intelligence uh, and espionage capacities of Thomas Picton. And it was fairly easy for Mariño uh, and others to uh, deceive uh, Munro's uh, schemes and therefore uh, it was a lot a lot easier. At the time, by the way, it was a different scenario in 1812 uh, because of the Napoleonic Wars that were taking place in, in Europe, uh, Spain and, 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 and the UK and Great Britain had found uh, an strange alliance and therefore now Munro, British, the British did not agree or did not support the Venezuelan independence movement. And this is uh, difficult for Mariño because now he had to organize this ex expedition from Chacachacare to Venezuela. But having the, the governor of Trinidad uh, uh, prohibiting him to, uh, from doing this. But the, 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 good, the good thing about all this, uh, the, the, the positive oh, something happened anyway but something that uh, assisted or, or, or aided uh, Mariño in his endeavors is the fact that as I said he grew up partly he grew up in, in Trinidad so he knew Trinidad very well uh, he knew how to speak English he was uh, acquainted with the society of the time in Trinidad uh, he had attended school here, and as I said, he also had joined the Trinidad militia. Of course, at the time, he was a uh, uh, part of uh, Spain, but he had lots of connections in Trinidad. So in spite of the fact that uh, Governor Hector William Munro was uh, really looking after him and, and, and trying to um, make things difficult for him to organize uh, this expedition or any kind of movement that would be working towards the independence of Venezuela. Mariño, because of his useful contacts in Trinidad, he was able to secure arms, ammunition, uh, money. Uh, he was also very popular, very likable individual. He was uh, very young at the time. He was only 24 uh, in, in 1812, 1813. Uh, so anyway, he was really a, 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 a charming person, and that was incredibly, incredibly positive uh, for the cause. He was able to secure, to recruit uh, uh, people to helping in this, uh, in this expedition. Many of the people who, who either he recruited or came voluntarily to help in this process were French. As I said, many French had come to Trinidad uh, at the time. Uh, but because in the interim in France, the French Revolution had taken place, many of the French who came over were actually French uh, Republicans or Republican or French who supported uh, the Republican ideas. And they immediately, of course, aligned with Mariño and with the ideas of having independence in Venezuela and uh, later on uh, uh, securing a re republic uh, system of government instead of a monarchy. That was the proposal of, of, of Spain. So many French Republicans who lived in Trinidad automatically joined uh, Mariño's uh, forces on the Chacachacari expedition. Many of them as well were mulattos from the Caribbean islands who were also obviously eager to help this movement against uh, uh, um, the, the uh, monarchies, uh, ideals, uh, particularly from Spain. This is when one particular um, hero that uh, became a hero in Venezuela, and I brought some books about him, Jean, Baptiste, Jean uh, Baptiste Bidot, coming from St. Lucia. Uh, he was a, 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 a vessel mechanic. He owned his own vessel as well. He actually, he, he was from St. Lucia, but he had been living in Trinidad after the opening of Trinidad to uh, people from uh, France or, or French uh, colonies in the Caribbean. But he immediately uh, got along with uh, Mariño and supported Mariño, supported the the uh, the Venezuelan Revolution, the the independence movement, and so on. And, and he was really uh, an important person 
not only because he assisted uh, us in gaining our independence, he assisted Santiago Marino, but also because of his determination and love uh, to Venezuela. We will see later on in, in, in our history, in 1816, only a few years after, uh, our, our uh, hero, Simón Bolívar, uh, he was about to commit suicide. He was about to kill himself. And it was Bido who actually stopped Bolívar from committing suicide. Uh, had, had it not been for Bido, we wouldn't have Simon Bolivar and all the endeavors that, that he did. That, this is quite remarkable. But one of the first moments in history when Bido supported Venezuela was at the Chacar Chacare expedition. And another person that was uh, uh, very important in, in, in securing uh, the whole uh, Chaca Chacare expedition uh, was no other than Santiago Mariño's sister, uh, Concepcion Mariño. I, I, this is important to highlight as well, because, well, you know, this better than me, that unfortunately, uh, history is rarely mentions the important role of women, uh, especially the traditional historiography, historiography uh, of, of uh, decades and perhaps even centuries ago. Uh, but lately, fortunately, there has been revisions of uh, the history where, of course, the role of uh, women and the, uh, the gender aspect is, is much more uh, taken care of and, and carefully looked at. And when you look at this, you see the relevant, the remarkable importance of Santiago Mariño's sister, Concepcion Mariño, not only because she really helped in the whole process of organizing the expedition of Chaca Chacare, but because he, she was the actual owner of the Chacachacar estate that Mariño's father had in, uh, 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 bestowed uh, upon her uh, after they, they passed. Uh, basically, they had states in Margarita Island and in Trinidad. Mariño, Santiago Mariño uh, became the owner of the state in, in, in Margarita Island and also in Wiria, in where it's currently Sucre State. But um, Concepcion Mariño was the owner of uh, Chacachacar. So she lent obviously the, the, the whole islet of Chaka Chacare for the planning, for the training of the expedition. She was very instrumental in securing supplies, logistics, and so on. She was really, really a, an intelligent woman who also, just like her brother Santiago had grown up between Venezuela and Trinidad, she knew all the, the char social characteristics of both countries and so on. So both of them really uh, uh, were, were magnificent in terms of uh, getting this um, this operation in place. Just just to briefly tell you about the operation is that on early in 1813, on the 11th of January of 1813, 45 uh, in this case men uh, signed up a declaration. It's called the Chacachacare Declaration, where they swore to either liberate Venezuela or die in the process. You have to be very brave to to really uh, 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 offer your life uh, for for uh, um, an enterprise that you never know if it's going to come out well. There were at least 300 Spaniards waiting on the other side in Guiria in Venezuela, just waiting on them, uh, most likely to be slaughtered in the process. So on the 11th of uh, January 1813, they gather at the state of Concepcion Mariño. Uh, according to the documentations, they offered a, a, a barbecue for all the soldiers. They were having a, a good time of relaxation before going into this uh, dangerous uh, enterprise. And nonetheless, they took off uh, in two boats. They only had six rifles, a lot of uh, machetes uh, uh, that, that they took along with them. And by the 13th, the early hours, the wee hours of the 13th of January, uh, Mariño and, and also uh, one individual that uh, haven't commented, but very important in Venezuelan history, Manuel Piar, both of them were able to secure Wiria in, in Western Venezuela, uh, I'm sorry, in Eastern Venezuela. And from there on, the whole liberation of Venezuela began. Uh, they, they started gaining control of many other important towns in Eastern Venezuela, Maturin, Barcelona, uh, and many others. 
at the same time, practically, Simon Bolivar was coming from Colombia and he was also able to secure the uh, liberation of uh, Western Venezuela. And it was only in August of 1813 that both Mariño and Simon Bolivar met in Caracas. And this was the inauguration of the Second Republic. This, this is why I'm saying that Chaka Chacare was really the beginning of our second liberation. And this is uh, the important relevance that I wanted to highlight. Just to, to finalize, uh, one may think that uh, ideally, one may say, well, Bolivar and Mariño, they both were uh, struggling to gain independence. They did their best. Bolivar from Colombia, Mariño from Trinidad. They were successful. They met in Caracas. They inaugurated the Second Republic and they became the best friends ever. Well, unfortunately, that wasn't the case. You know, history and politics have certain uh, tendencies that, that, that really uh, are out of uh, the control of how we would like to see an ideal world. They, they, the fact is that they really became very uh, strong folks. Nonetheless, they were, I mean, they, they both were strongly minded in terms of their in the ideas for independence of Venezuela. But the main reason why they were not in agreement was uh, mostly a political but important political aspect. And, and is the following. Simon Bolivar was of the idea that the point was not to just gain the independence of Venezuela or gain the independence of Colombia or gain the independence of Peru and so on and having several countries, independent countries, as is the case right now. He actually thought that independence in itself was not the, 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 the ultimate goal, but it, it, would, it should be a way to achieving the Latin American and Caribbean unity, that the whole of the Caribbean and the whole of Latin America needed to be one single country. Uh, example, just like the United States was after the 13 colonies and so on, more, more or less that was the, the idea of Simon Bolivar. Well, Mariño didn't think that that was the answer. Mariño and many others uh, in Colombia, uh, Santander, also Jose Antonio Paez and so on, they thought that no, that, that each country needed to be independent. And this is also the uh, dilemma or debate between centralism and federalism. Bolivar thought that the best possible government was to have a centralist republic where all these uh, former colonies would be united in one single unit and so on. Well, Mariño thought that uh, it was better to have, in fact, Mariño even thought that it was better for Eastern Venezuela to be an independent country, not even the whole of Venezuela. But he, if he would have, if he would have his way, he would have split Venezuela into two parts and he would have been the president and the leader of just Eastern Venezuela where he was very popular by the way. So because of that, there were many uh, confrontations, innuendos, uh, disagreements between uh, Bolivar and Santiago Mariño. But I think the bottom line remains, nonetheless, that, um, that, that they both had the idea of liberating Venezuela in itself. And that's important. And the fact that Mariño, in spite of all the difficulties and many odds against him and against his cause, he was able to achieve something as incredible as organizing a group of four, only 45 people to leave from Chacachacari, which is very small, all the way to Guiria and actually defeat uh, Juan Gavazo was the the Spanish uh, military officer waiting for him in Guiria, but he was actually able to, he was really a military genius. And in that in itself needs to be praised, uh, need, needs to be deserved further investigation, research. And as I said at the beginning, um, the idea of uh, understanding the strategic aspect of uh, Trinidad for Venezuelans and for Venice, in the strategic aspect of Venezuela for, for Trinidad, or what is currently Trinidad and Tobago. A, 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 a partnership that definitely uh, nowadays needs to be strengthened for a variety of reasons, especially in the world where we live. Just to finalize, uh, allow me to just show to you these uh, images. What you see there is a sword, actually a, a, a artillery a machete from the artillery that was recently found, when I say recently, late last year, something like October of last year, was found in Guiria. And this is a relic from the Chacachacari expedition, from the soldiers who were led by Mariño, who 
45 soldiers who uh, went to, to fight against the Spaniards and, and gain uh, the foothold in Eastern Venezuela. They recently found this in, in, in a house of a private individual that it, it, was, it, it came out. And according to experts and historians in Venezuela, and so on, they have come to the realization that this is this came from the Chacachacari expedition. Hopefully, one day, uh, and again, we is really near Trinidad, but hopefully, uh, at some point, we can have uh, following all the protocols and so on, have uh, this uh, piece, this weapon, to Trinidad to be exhibited, so people can see for firsthand uh, uh, the importance and the relevance. Uh, of this historical uh, achievement uh, in Venezuela. Well, a little bit of a biography of Santiago Mariño. The, just to briefly uh, tell you, you can also look at the uh, bibliography uh, that I have uh, used for this uh, research. One of the books, which is the by uh, Mr. He passed away, the late uh, Paul Verna, which I'm going to leave a few uh, here. Uh, at, at UWI is uh, the life of uh, uh, Juan Bautista Vido, Jean Baptiste Vido, the man from San Lucia who uh, aided Venezuela many, many uh, times, but the Chacachacara expedition was a relevant one. And here uh, it shows, uh, it tells uh, Mr. Bernard, tells us uh, about his, his life. Uh, in addition, I have brought other books that I also like to leave with you. This particular one is very, very good. Uh, uh, is the life of Simón Bolívar by Indalecio Lievano Aguirre, because it, it shows not only his life itself, which is really, really epic, but the fact that uh, how his ideas, being a rich man, uh, at the end of the day, Simón Bolívar was a, a, a part of, of the landholding owners and the most rich families of Venezuela and Latin America. He really uh, gave up all his wealth to follow the ideas of equality and egalitarianism uh, for Venezuela. So not only he wanted to Venezuela to be independent, he wanted Venezuela to be united with the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean. That in itself is very progressive. But in addition to that, he wanted to have a, a society that would be equal for, uh, with education for everyone, with the liberation of enslaved uh, people, uh, uh, the um, progress of indigenous people. It was really a tremendous, uh, individual. This book explains that uh, very well. And also, this is uh, the education ideas of uh, Simon Bolivar. I promise that I will bring you one about Francisco de Miranda, who is also another quite uh, interesting individual in Venezuelan uh, history. Okay, I will, I will finish here. Sorry if I exceeded the time. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I am open for any queries, questions that, that you may have, not only now, but is, if in the future you may have some uh, questions on this aspect of Venezuelan history or any aspect of Venezuelan history, especially if it links with uh, Trinidad, I will be more than happy to uh, do my best to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Definitely a wonderful history class for in that we have had this this afternoon. I have um, a few questions here. So far, I believe I will divide them in. Uh, I will make a round of three questions now that are kind of interlinked together, and then uh, after your first reaction, I I can add two or three more that I have so far. But of course, as the ambassador said, we invite the, the audience to put your questions into the chat that we have in the in our Zoom um, room, virtual room, so we can um, have more questions for the ambassador in case you are interested. Um, well, the, the first um, three questions I have are related to Francisco de Miranda. And uh, th there are, there are a first question is, about is Francisco de Miranda uh, considered a national hero in Venezuela? This is a question by Angela Knight. We also have another question that is related about this episode that you were explaining about Francisco de Miranda surrendering uh, surrender to, to Monteverde. Could, could we have some type of um, suspicion of treason 
could are we thinking maybe of Francisco de Miranda becoming more conservative, maybe because of his age at the time? It is in 1812. Maybe he has been through many fights as you were recounting in his life. And he started to rethink about the strategy that he said was the, the best to uh, conquest the independence. So what are your thoughts? What historians might tell us about the inner motivations of Francisco de Miranda surrendering to, to Monteverde in 1812? And the third question very related to that is, is, uh, is about Bolivar's um, giving Francisco, Francisco de Miranda to the Spaniards. I, I, I remember this is also a very complicated issue in history because the motivations there are not quite clear. And this is linked to my previous question. Do you believe or are historians that might believe that Bolivar thought about Francis, Francisco de Miranda um, becoming a, a traitor at the end of his life? What do you think about that? Thank you, Dr. LaGuardia, and thank you to Ms. Angela Knight. I happen to have a friend named Angela Knight uh, in Barbados, maybe the same person. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Well, hey, hi to Ms. Angela, a very good friend of, of ours. Uh, the time we were in Barbados, uh, she was always and still is a, a very good friend of ours and very good friend of, of Venezuela. Very interesting and good questions. Uh, the first one is definitely Venice, uh, Francisco de Miranda is a remarkable, outstanding Venezuelan hero. Uh, in fact, he carries two titles that are very meaningful to us. One is Generalissimo, like the, the, the super general, uh, the above generals uh, in terms of uh, his uh, military wisdom uh, and so on. But he's also uh, named or, or he's also uh, uh, described as the forerunner of our independence, uh, uh, precursor, precursor de la independencia, our independence forerunner, in, in the sense that uh, prior to the marvelous achievements by Simón Bolívar, uh, years later, we had Francisco de Miranda aiming for, for the same goals. As a matter of fact, uh, also Miranda can be linked to Bolívar in the sense that he also had the idea of uh, uniting the Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and those, those ideas were very, very, were not well understood then. In fact, they're not even well understood now. In many ways, uh, for example, when President Chavez came to power 20 years ago, uh, in, uh, inspired very much by Bolivar's ideas, one of the things that he proposed was full integration of Latin America and the Caribbean and uniting Car Venezuela and the Caribbean. And even then it was, sorry, only 20 years ago and he was not understood fully uh, of, of his, that Im important uh, idea. Jose Marti as well had, uh, was also eager to see the ideas of Simón Bolívar being materialized. But anyway, Miranda uh, was and still is a very, very important uh, hero uh, in Venezuela. Uh, absolutely. But as I said, uh, when I was speaking, what took place in 1812 between Francisco and Miranda and Simon Bolivar is, is very intriguing to, to, to everyone. There are many people and I don't know, it depends how you interpret. At the end of the day, you have to do some doc document interpretation uh, because none of them really left anything uh, uh, in writing about that particular uh, incident. Perhaps Simon Bolivar ventured to speak a little bit about that in the diary of Bucaramanga at the end of his life and so on, but not in, 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 in lots of, of detail. Uh, one can only assume perhaps that Simon Bolivar was quite young at that time. Uh, he was just uh, beginning, I think, uh, looking back uh, later in his later years, probably, I, I think that he would not have done that with the much more experience that he gained uh, uh, later in his life. As far as Francisco and Miranda goes, I agree with uh, Ms. Angela and I said, it's a, a, we're talking about a, a man who was already in, the, in his 60s. At that time, being over 60 years old is like being today 90 years old, I guess. It's a, anyone who will be 60 years old uh, in those centuries, the uh, 18th, 19th century, 
uh, it, it was really about the average of uh, life expectancy of the time, but of course, much more mature, perhaps more 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 uh, uh, realistic in terms of what he could achieve and so on. Different from the young Miranda who was traveling all over Europe, creating things, doing stuff. And, and because of that, well, assuming that he was acting in good faith, he really, and that's according to the papers and letters that he sent to uh, Domingo de Monteverde, he said, look, let's save people's life. We, we may continue killing ourselves in, for no reason. Okay, fine. Take over uh, Venezuela or, or continue with uh, uh, Venezuela, but uh, leave us, uh, let us uh, respect our lives, leave us in peace, and, and we'll see what happens uh, afterwards. Uh, Again, is is I think is is a very important question, and for which I think a lot more historical research, especially by new gener generations and so on, with a different view, uh, uh, can actually determine what really really happened uh, there. Because it was really sad that the last time that these both important heroes. Venezuelan, Latin American world heroes like Simón Bolívar and Miranda, the last time ever that they saw each other was for something as dramatic and distasteful uh, as this. One surrendering and the other one uh, giving the other, Miranda, to the Spanish authorities and, and this, is, this was the demise of uh, Francisco de Miranda. Thank you so much for for these um, answers. I have uh, now I have two questions that are related to the British governors that were in in Trinidad and at the time that you mentioned. There is a there is a question I don't know if you might have the the answer to it, and it says that um, there is a Picton Street in Trinidad. Do you believe is there any connection between Thomas Picton and Picton Picton Street? And the other one more uh, specific about uh, the roles of these British governor, governors is this following question. What was the role specifically of Ralph Goodford referenced during the period 1813 to 1828? Much, uh, yes. Uh, well, the, 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 let me start with the, the second one. Uh, even between Picton and Munro, there were some other two or three governors, but I, I wanted to specifically touch upon Picton because not only, as I said, because the, the, the network of intelligence that he put in place in, in Trinidad was, was going to have consequences, uh, uh, in, in many respects, negative consequences for Venezuelan uh, independence uh, movement, uh, in spite of the fact, as I said, that, that he, he was in theory, supporting Francisco de Miranda, he was supporting Venezuelan uh, patriots and so on. But but uh, with his particular imprint, if you know what I mean. But the the uh, things change when when Munro uh, came to power because the geopolitics had changed mainly because of the Napoleonic uh, wars. And Munro basically lost his job as being governor of uh, Trinidad after the Chacachacari expedition. Uh, uh, British authorities could not understand how he was not able to stop Mariño from taking off Chaka Chacare and liberating uh, Venezuela, in spite of the fact that apparently uh, uh, he was uh, informed by authorities, Spanish authorities in Venezuela were actually giving him information about uh, what was going on in Chaka Chacare, but he apparently thought that he knew better and anyway he really apparently was a mess fortunately for us because obviously Mariño was able to obtain the the well the, his his um, expedition uh, was successful so he was only very briefly in power uh, after Chaka Chakari he was gone and this is when uh, Woodford came to power but the the I would say that the importance of Woodford in respect to Venezuela is that practically the rest of the time of uh, our independence struggle in Venezuela, at that time, uh, Woodford was the governor of the British governor, governor in Trinidad, practically up until uh, the end of our liberation even, and, and even uh, beyond. The position of the British government towards Venezuela was very, very ambiguous. 
it ultimately depending on the character and the personality and and the realities that each British governor will find in Trinidad in the case of of, of Trinidad. So it depends. I I think I, I will have to look further or, or deeply into uh, Woodford's uh, uh, position uh, towards Simon Bolivar, Venezuela, and so on. But for example, it coincides. Is 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 this is a, an, another important aspect. When Woodford was in in power uh, as governor of Trinidad, was the time when years later, Simon Bolivar went to Jamaica and Haiti to seek aid for again the liberation plans of Venezuela. And one important, very very important um, independence hero of Venezuela who became very prominent. Perhaps to the to the league in the leagues of Francisco de Miranda and Simon Bolivar was Antonio José de Sucre, who is from Eastern Venezuela, who was, I'm sorry, from Eastern Venezuela. Well, when Bolivar was in Haiti seeking aid to Petion in order to reconquest Venezuela uh, and so on, this magnificent leader, Venezuelan leader Antonio José de Sucre, was also here in Trinidad. And at the time, uh, Woodford was the governor. I will have to look more into what the relationship was, if any. But I tend to believe that for him to be here, perhaps some kind of a um, good opinion or at least uh, a, a good reception on behalf of Woodford would have been in order to allow him to be here unless he was inefficient like Monroe in terms of not fully knowing who was in or out, but, but I really doubt it because I, my understanding is that Woodford was uh, much more uh, wise than, than Monroe was. Thank you, thank you so much, Ambassador. I have um, a couple of, of questions more. There is another question by Angela Knight, and she would like to know if back at the time, at the historic period you were you were talking about, um, have, do you know about the specific parts back then in where Venezuelans preferred to settle in Trinidad? Is there any type of continuity continu in time in terms of Venezuelan settlements in Trinidad at the in the 19th century, late late 18th, 19th century, and places where Venezuelans might be established themselves today? Uh, what what do you know? What can you share with us uh, about that? very much yes that's also a very very good and, and important uh question yes i'm referring here mostly about independence heroes moving and so on which is important but remember there were also people regular day people who were also moving in and out of venezuela and and i think i will answer that question correctly if we referred to the early in the early 19th century Many, many pe Venezuelan peasants from a, 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 a peasants from cocoa fields in Venezuela came to to Trinidad basically as migrant workers, or you can even say that they were indentured workers uh, who were very much needed in cocoa plantations here in Trinidad, mainly in what is now Lopino, uh, Arima. Santa Cruz, that area where there were many, and there still are many, uh, cocoa uh, production. But the people who actually worked very hard were brought from Venezuela to work on the cocoa plantations. This is where the famous cocoa pañoles, uh, as people in Trinidad refer to Venezuelans who originally came from Venezuela to work in cocoa plantations uh, back then. Even up to up, up until today, you the reference of coco pañoles is quite common in Trinidad to refer to to refer to Venezuelans who came over to work uh, at that time uh, as indentured workers, uh, most of them. And even culturally, you you can see it. For example, there is a beautiful cultural expression uh, in Trinidad that is musical. It's called parang. Parang is really the music in Venezuela. is called parranda. But this is music that was brought to Trinidad by the Coco Pañoles that the Venezuelan uh, indentured laborers brought with them to Trinidad in the early uh, 19th century. They even eat in the in Christmas time. There is a traditional dish here called pastel 
that also came from Venezuela. We call it ayaca, but even back then, I presume that it was called pastel. Uh, uh, but it's basically the same dish. But so th this is one aspect. And if you ask me for the geographical location, I would say that mostly uh, they can be found in the north corridor, uh, Arima, Santa Cruz, Lopino, La Pastora, and so on. Also in the south is mostly in the indigenous people uh, or indigenous communities who uh, are still even today coming in and out because for them really, as, as is obvious, for them is really one land that belongs to them. It's not really the, the differences, the political demarcations and so on is something that the white man brought here for no reason. And of course, they understand that the whole of the Americas, the Abdayala is uh, their true homeland of the indigenous people. Thanks, uh, Ambassador, again. I have uh, another question and remark. This is, um, this is made by Ray Brethwaite. He would like to know more about uh, Simon Bolivar and Nelson Island. I'm not sure what Nelson Island refers. I'm not sure if it's a, a, a person, a, a historic character, or a geographic uh, location. So, I mean, if, if uh, Ray Brethwaite could uh, add a little bit more about why I, what the question is about could be great. I'm just posing the question in case you are aware of what Nelson Island might be. Sorry, he may be referring to Nelson Island in Trinidad, who, which is a small island or islet as well, uh, that uh, many times has served as a prison, as a center for uh, people with uh, leprosy, where, where they have been con in confinement, uh, has been a jail. Uh, in, in the characteristics of uh, Nelson Island, if I'm not mistaken, are similar to Chaka Chakar in the sense of being small places that have been used later on for military purposes or social purposes. But honestly, any connection between Simon Bolivar and Nelson Island, I have no idea. Maybe if that person has some information, I would love to know so I can further learn about it. <laughs> but my, that must be the Nelson Island that he's referring to, I guess. Another two questions I have. Well, one has to do with um trying to find out if good for square in port spain is named after ralph good for the british governor i'm well i don't know if you might have the, the answer to it i suppose yes but i'm not sure yes correct it's after him yeah and the other question i believe you already talked a little bit uh, about that and it has to do with uh well yes well, I'm I'm getting Mr. Brathwaite saying that yes, Nelson Island is in in Trinidad, and it's it's believed that Bolivar used it to launch uh to launch of his his mission. So maybe there is something else to be researched in terms of Nelson Island and its role in this all this historic process of um, Latin American independence. Um, another another question that maybe we might have a little bit time to to cover has to do with the role of the of the Caribbean island on the Venezuelan independence and Latin American independence. We already, we talked today about the role of Trinidad, and you mentioned very briefly about the role of Jamaica and Haiti. So how could you please explain not not in depth, but to mention like key important features relating Simon Bolivar to Haiti and to Jamaica in his quest for independence, please? A very, very, very good question. And I'll try to be brief because this is quite a, it could be an extensive answer. But basically, uh, after 1815, when the Second Republic was lost, Simon Bolivar had to flee practically with nothing uh, uh, with him to first to Jamaica and then uh, to Haiti, looking for aid. In Jamaica, Jamaica is important because in Jamaica, he wrote a whole statement. It's called the Letter of Jamaica. And in it, if you read it, it shows really his vision of what or how he wanted to see Latin America and the Caribbean, again, mostly as a united uh, uh, nation. Uh, but more important than that, in my understanding, was his trip to Haiti. Because at the time, remember that Haiti was the only uh, Black enslaved country that had gained its independence or former enslaved, enslaved people had gained their independence 
in a very, very uh, dramatic and heroic uh, way. And Simon Bolivar actually went to uh, Petion, who was Alexander Petion, the president of, of Haiti, requesting for, for aid. And Petion provided to Simon Bolivar, not only with financial, logistical assistance and support, but I would say more importantly, he also gave Bolivar a spiritual, educational assistance in terms of how to best conceive a future nature in Venezuela and Latin America that will be really decolonized, which is uh, that's, that's something that we haven't spoke about here. But really, colonization doesn't end with the declaration of independence or the gaining of independence. Colonization is still present with us all throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. But ever since that time, with all the assistance that Alexander Petion gave to Simon Bolivar, uh, the, the ideas of decolonizing people's mind throughout the region for years to come, he gained that by conversing, discussing, and planning with uh, Petion. At the moment, I would say that uh, Venezuelan independence is valued for many, many reasons, but one important aspect is that without Haiti, really, Venezuela would not be where we are right now. I have a, a final question, at least from my end, and it has to do with the with a present day type of question and this relation between Venezuela and Trinidad. And the question is asking about this movement that we have today of Venezuelans coming to, to Trinidad. In your perspective, what, uh, in terms of the reasons there, uh, how much you can track or which numbers do you have about pe Venezuelan people in Trinidad today? Are they here by, it says, legitimate work and they are able to arrive by using legitimate uh, channels or how much of that non-registered movement you believe it exists? And I'm, I'm, I'm making the link in terms of the historic movement that we have had between Venezuela and Trinidad. I'm sure that back in the day, they were not uh, necessary registers of how much people move, but today we might be able to track a little bit more of that. So do you have any number? Do you have any figure that you can share about the intensity and the dynamics of this uh, movement today? More complex, <laughs> complicated uh, question, more into today's uh, realities. Well, I, I, I really have to, to answer that question properly. I really, really have to refer so, to some or provide some political context. It, this is uh, uh, the only way to answer really that question. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there is a, a whole systematic scheme, international scheme abroad to try to destabilize Venezuela. Uh, the reasons vary, but among others is the fact that Venezuela is actually leading a revolution where we really want to become a sovereign and independent, just like, like the ideas of Simón Bolívar uh, uh, a couple of centuries uh, ago. So because of that, the, as I said, you, I can really, well, we may have to have another session, but there has been any, trick in the book that you can think of by the CIA in terms of attacking our economy, uh, assisting into coup d'etat, uh, creating havoc on the streets, um, uh, attempting against the life of our president, performing a whole psychological warfare against uh, our population, in, uh, blockading financially Venezuela, imposing illegal and coercive uh, sanctions against uh, our country, all with the objective of regime change and bringing down the Bolivarian revolution and the president of Venezuela. Part of that scheme is to actually exacerbate and exaggerate the number of Venezuelans that have to leave Venezuela, mainly because, of course, if they're sabotaging our economy, we will have little resources to, or many people will have less resources to maintain themselves and they, they go. The numbers are grossly exaggerated for political reasons and we, one cannot even uh, uh, consider in providing numbers in a way because that will be part of the game that they want to play in order to, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, continue or strengthening their 
their their their idea of of, of bringing uh, our country and our society uh, uh, down. What I can say, nonetheless, is that fortunately our economy is recovering. Uh, um, uh, the growth of Venezuela uh, is one of the largest uh, in the whole of the Latin American and Caribbean region at the moment, and this is a, a way. And, and because of that, many Venezuelans who had left uh, the country for because of this sabotage uh, against our economy, and also because they follow blindly the the advices of uh, of many opposition and political leaders who actually encourage them to to leave without thinking of the consequences of su such actions many of them are actually returning to venezuela so for sure the number of venezuelans abroad for these reasons and this applies to trinidad as well are much less than they were in the during the height of the attacks which uh, were actually between 2015, 16, and 2020 or so. That, that, that was when, at the moment, fortunately, things have changed, among other reasons, but not only, and to an extent, because in the United States, we no longer have Donald Trump as, as president, who was really, really uh, 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 being a, a negative force in, in this whole scheme a, against our, our country. But uh, uh, nonetheless, the problems uh, in terms of the, the meddling of uh, American politics into our nation persist uh, uh, to a lesser extent, but they're still there. But on the other hand, we are recovering from it. And I can assure you that the number of Venezuelans abroad are re reducing, are, are uh, decreasing, and many of them are returning to Venezuela. I, I believe that we have uh, exhausted the time for question and answer. I, actually, we gave you a, a lot to, to think about from different perspectives, history, politics. Um, having said that, uh, I would like from my, my part because my I hope everyone is hearing me. I don't know. I, it seems as if Dr. Lagardio was cut off. Um, yes. Good evening. I hope everyone is hearing me. Um, and good evening to all the attendees and all the and gentlemen in attendance. Um, okay. I don't know, Ms. Munsami, should I continue? Is the audio functioning? Yes, thank you, thank you. As I said, good evening, everyone. Um, a special good evening to His Excellency Ambassador Alvaro Sanchez Padero of the Bolivarian, Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, um, to our Interim Director, Dr. Anita Montut, and to Dr. Lagardia Martinez, um, the host and coordinator of this event. Special, special good evening to all staff and fellow students from the University of the West Indies, um, together with any special invited guests or, dis or any who are distinguished guests. I have the honor and privilege this evening to offer the vote of thanks on behalf of the Institute for today's pre presentation by um, His Excellency. Um, firstly, my sincerest thanks to His Excellency for not only providing an informative and illuminating session, as to the hard and long fought independence of Venezuela um, with, in regards to our geographical ties and our shared history. It was also enriching, um, yet ironic, to know of the support for Venezuelan independence from our various British governors at different levels um, throughout our history. You may all agree that we are already familiar with the iconic um, figure um, Simon Bolivar in terms of liberalism and freedom um, in both Latin America and the Caribbean. However, 
it was eye-opening to learn of the rich contributions and backgrounds of Francisco de Morando, or as his excellency referred to him as, the Generalismo, together with Santiago Marino, in regards to Venezuelan independence from Spain. Their rich and complicated histories as Venezuelan heroes on a personal note for me, brought to life the imagery and history of our neighbor and sister um, in one of my favorite Netflix programs, um, Bolivar. It was also wonderful to learn of the importance of Marino's sister as the then owner of the Shaka Shakari estate in her role as a woman in securing supplies and the logistical strategy for the expedition she contributed. His Excellency's presentation was immersive as to the 1813 gathering at the estate in depicting the role of Shaka Shakari in Venezuela's second liberation. Personal points of history serve as, such as these serve to deepen the ties between our two states beyond a superficial lens of just geography. If His Excellency will allow me, I would love to refer to that inimitable group of soldiers as a group of 45 liberators. On behalf of the Institute, I am grateful for the ambassador for sharing the truths in terms of the political dissent that arose between Bolivar and Marino. Sometimes history can mythologize figures and not show their flaws, difficulties or struggles, but more importantly, their passion as men to seek the liberation and freedom tirelessly um, for Venezuela. Particularly when we exist in a time that by choice or otherwise, other nations do not share our sovereignty or liberalized state. This 210th anniversary ambassador is our anniversary as well um, in sharing Venezuela's liberation from Spain after 300 years of rule. Thank you for taking the time to partner and collaborate with the Institute to build our ties and also our knowledge base as students and practitioners of, of international relations. My sincerest thanks to Dr. LaGuardia Martinez for the conceptualization of this event, together with our supporting stakeholders such as UV's Marketing and Communications Office, together with Ms. Chanel Munsami, Clerical Officer, for the execution of this pre presentation in such a flawless manner. We are grateful and thank you for taking the time to share your knowledge and time with us, and we are happy to have you again. Um, on a personal note, Ambassador, I, have, I as well, like other, I think another speaker, another student or viewer in the audience, have a distant Venezuelan um, relation, and I'm happy to share the history that comes with the knowledge you brought. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm ending the, the session now. I would like to thank everyone that had uh, attended the session. Uh, especially, uh, well, again, of course, the ambassador that took the time to be here this afternoon, the team of the Venezuelan embassy that has also been working to make this session possible, and of course, our technical staff here at the Institute of International Relations at the University of the West Indies, the team of marketing and communications, uh, the the staff in the secretarial, and of course, Dr. Montu that welcomed this initiative very enthusiastically when we uh, had the, the idea of putting this session of the diplomatic dialogue. So as I said uh, before, happy uh, afternoon to everyone, and we will meet again in another diplomatic dialogue.